Covenant Church has been rooted in the North Park, San Diego neighborhood for over 70 years. We believe that God is restoring his creation and renewing lives in our church, our neighborhood, our city, and cultures around the world for his glory. My name is Patrick, and I'm the lead pastor here, and I'd personally love to invite you to join us Sunday at 10 a.m. in North Park at the corner of Howard and 30th. Thanks. Well, good morning and welcome to Covenant. If you're a guest with us this morning, a special welcome. My name is Patrick. If we haven't had a chance to meet, you know, our call to worship from Psalm 63 talks about earnestly seeking the Lord. And I imagine with a group like this size, some of us are earnestly seeking the Lord today. We are excited to be here. We are leaning in. And for some of us, we're just stumbling into this place. But whether we're earnestly seeking or we're stumbling in, the good news is that God invites us. He calls us to worship him today with our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. So I invite you to stand, if you would, as we read these words from Psalm 63 and speak about seeking the Lord. And whether this is the posture of our heart or a desire that we want, Lord, we, we read these words together. Hearing these words, call us and invite us into this space. I'll do the leader portion Please join aloud in the all portion. Peace be with you. You, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. We have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. We will praise you as long as we live, and in your name we will lift up our hands. Father, we thank you that we are called to this space. Lord, we don't initiate to you. Lord, you come to us first and we respond. So Lord, thank you that you have called us, you have invited us, you've drawn us to this space. And Lord, I pray in this space in heart, in mind, in body, in soul, we might be present and think of you. And Lord, let the thoughts of you and the idea of you and your your magnitude and your mightiness and yet your nearness and your mercy, Lord, may it drive us to fill our lungs with your praise, to lean forward into prayer, to have hearts receptive to what you have for us. So Lord, we pray all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. everyone let's sing of the great hope that we have in Jesus this morning there is now a hope that lasts beyond our days there is now a hope that lasts beyond our days for the one that once was buried lives again now the tomb is bare and empty and the stone is rolled Praise the risen one who overcame the grave. 
Savior, our good and gracious King.
gracious King Oh, what grace that you would see me As your child and as your friend Safe, secure in you forever Good morning. Are we on? Yeah. So now we're going to come to a time of confession. And uh, with confession, often there is this idea of repentance, right? You repent for something and then you confess it. Um, and when I say that word repent or repentance, what comes to mind for you? What do you feel? What, what do you think about when I say you need to repent? In our culture, in our time today, um, the idea of repentance has the connotation of probably like, I, I feel bad, or there's contrition, there might be shame, there might be guilt, there might be fear, and some of that, to some degree, is understandable. But when we look back at Jesus' time, uh, in the Jewish mindset, when uh, John introduce Jesus in his ministry and baptize him, he was saying, repent for the kingdom of God is here. When Jesus began his ministry, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is here. His hearers would have been hearing change, change your mind, right? You've been thinking one way, I need, to, uh, I need you to believe something different based on the evidence, based that the kingdom of God is coming. Not only do you change your mind, but you also change 
your direction or you change your action. So if you're doing this, you're turning away from it, and then you're also turning to God, right? So in that sense, when you think about repentant, it's more about changing your mind and changing your action. Years ago, I um, climbed Mount Whitney. It's one of the biggest peaks in California. It's about a little bit over 14,000 square feet. It's on the 395 on the way up to Mammoth. And I did it with about 10 other guys. The guy who organized the trip was a friend of mine, partner in ministry. He lived up in Mammoth for many years, so he knew the mountain. And he was living here in San Diego. And we did this trip. He's up there now again. He and some other friends had tried to climb it months before, but it was winter, so the snow kept them from doing it. So he was determined he was going to do this. And uh, so we started the climb, and you can do it in a couple days, or you can do it in one day if you like. And we chose to do it in one day, go up and down. So many people get to the, you climb about five, 6,000 feet, you camp, and then you, you, you crest the peak the next day. Uh, but we got there, and so we started to climb up. At the face, there's these switchbacks. So you're going up and down, back and forth, back and forth. And it's, it's a grueling climb, uh, pretty challenging. So we did that, and we got kind of extended. Some people were going faster than others. So we got to the top, and I, when you get to this top, it's not really the top. You still, you crest, and you can see on the back side of the mountain, but then you have to go through the back of it to climb up to, to get to the actual peak. But when I got there, my friend, the leader of the group, was sitting on a rock looking back over the back of the mountain. And when we came to him, hey, what's up? He said, uh, we need to go down there. <laughs> so the problem was that the air gets a little thinner up there, so you can get um, altitude sickness, and he had it. So he wasn't thinking correctly. He wanted to go down to the back side of the mountain, which would have been total wilderness. I don't think that would have ended well. <laughs> And so we knew that the path went the other way. So we had to convince him to change his mind and change his direction, which I think saved him. I don't think he, he would be here, or if we would have followed him, I might not be here today. So all worked out well. We climbed and we actually reached the peak and came back down. So today, right now, we're going to do a time of confession. And I'm going to give you some time. I'm going to give you about half a minute to read um, our prayer of confession. Let's read this together. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us. I'm going to give you about half a minute to um, meditate on this and maybe see in what area the Spirit of God is asking you to change your mind and change your direction today. And now that we've had a little bit of time to do that, I want to encourage you with these words. They come from 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18. After we confess, after we bring things to God, it's always great to um, go back to Scripture. And it says this, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, not counting our sins against us, and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. Father, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your hope, for your love, for your calling, and your blessing on our lives. And we're humbled, Father, that you have loved us in such a way. And in Jesus' name, Amen. So if you'd like to stand with me, 
Now we're going to read the Apostles' Creed. By this, we declare together the essentials of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He ascended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we'll continue worshiping in song.
God, we thank you that uh, we can come before you in repentance, knowing that we are new creatures, that you've made us new beings in Jesus, which means we have a new start, uh, that it's in Jesus and in him alone that we can stand before you, that we can have that forgiveness, that we can be called sons and daughters of yours, uh, and that we stand in a new reality. We stand in the reality of your children, and you give that to us free, freely give it to us. You, we cannot earn it. We don't deserve it. And yet we stand here in Jesus and accepted by you. And we thank you for that reminder again this morning. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, at this time, the elementary and middle school kids are dismissed to your teachers at the back if you'd like to go. Uh, the rest of you, please take five minutes just to greet one another, uh, get your coffee, whatever you need to do. Uh, my name is Will Carreras, and I'm uh, an intern here. I'm also working on ordination. Um, so it's definitely my home. Um, we have some announcements today. First, we want to welcome everybody, and we especially want to welcome you if you're visiting today, if you're new. If you are new, we'd rather you not be new for too long, that you don't feel that way. So um, one of the ways of doing that is signing up for our weekly newsletter. You'll be in the know. You'll know what we're doing, what's coming up. Um, very easy. You can either, there's a, on the table, there's a, some sign-up cards. You can go online, you can um, scan this QR code, or you can email, so it's all there. Um, please go ahead and sign up. Also, we, we are a body of people that is on mission. We, are, um, we don't just come together just um, for our benefit, but also for the benefit of our community, of uh, our, our city, our nation, or the world. Um, and if you want to join us on that mission, you can do that in a variety of ways. And one of those is uh, by your giving. Um, you can, uh, if you'd like to give to the mission, there's some offering boxes out here. Again, you can also scan this QR code. You can uh, donate online. You can send a check into the church. The address is um, right there. So please join us in that way. So other announcements, we will have a senior luncheon next Saturday at 11.30 in the morning. That's going to be in the gymnasium over here. Um, music, um, and also uh, Patrick is going to do a short devotional and some food and fellowship. So you're welcome to come to that. Men's Bible study is ongoing. Uh, Bob Parrish is leading that. You can talk to him about it. His email address is here if you want more information. The next meeting town Time is uh, Saturday, February 18th um, at 9 a.m. They're discussing the leadership styles and comparisons between King David and King Saul. A lot of good information there. Also, more importantly, have donuts and coffee. So you're really going to want to be there. Okay. Also, women's Bible study, going through the book of Colossians. And Kennerly King is leading that. You can talk to her about that or you can email her for more information, but it's basically Tuesday mornings, um, 10, 15 in the morning. That time has childcare, so you can bring your kids. And then also Tuesday evenings, 5.30, starting at 5.30. No childcare, though, in the evening. Next, Ash Wednesday. Um, Ash Wednesday is a time when we uh, bring in Lent, which is uh, 40 days into uh, up to Easter not counting Sundays. So we will celebrate and start that on February 22nd at 6.30 p.m. We're going to have a service here. Um, and that is going to be a time of prayer, worship, and reflecting together as a community as we are shaped by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And important for that, there will also this year, we're going to have child care for that. So Please remember that. Okay, so um, if you will pray with me. Father, we can't help but come um, this morning here with just thankfulness. If we were even to stop and think about what it took for us to get here, Lord, just the fact that we can walk, we can talk, we can see all at different degrees, and we have the means to get here, Lord. Um, you've given us food today. You've provided their sunlight. Uh, you're gracious and good God, and we, we thank you for that. All the little things, Lord. 
As your body, as um, Covenant Church, we thank you that you have brought us together, that you give us this opportunity. And we pray that for us and for the church greater, the church in this country and the world, Lord, that you will empower your church to be a force for good, that um, the blessings just won't stop with us, that we will then turn around and bless the rest of the world, Lord, that we will be a force for good in this world. May we join you on your mission daily. Again, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we'll go into a time of scripture reading, and Melanie will be coming up for that. Today's scripture is from Matthew 6, 9 to 13, and John 6, 35 to 40. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you, Will and Melanie, for leading us in worship. And, you know, these past few weeks, we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer. You know, we've, we've read it each Sunday. We pray it around the table. And on the one hand, you might think it's kind of straightforward. It's kind of simplistic. I get it. But on the other hand, my hope is as we've been working through the Lord's Prayer and as you make the Lord's Prayer just a part of your, your praying life, you realize Maybe kind of like C.S. Lewis's wardrobe cabinet in the Chronicles of Narnia. The inside is bigger than the outside. It looks like a normal cabinet, but you go through that wardrobe and you enter into this world of Narnia. Simple words, we can pray this quickly, and yet there is so much to this prayer and so much depth. It opens with an address. Our Father in heaven. And then there's three petitions that are God-centered. Hallowed be your name, God. Your kingdom come, God. Your will be done. So we start with God. We address God, not as some distant deity, not as some sort of distant power, some vague, you know, supernatural reality. He's a father. He's our father in heaven. And so we hallow his name. We pray for his kingdom come. His will be done. We fix our eyes on him first. And then there's a turn in the prayer. As a turn we enter into today, three more petitions emerge, but these are kind of personal-centered, community-centered. We've, we've prayed and fixed our eyes on God, and now the prayer invites us to turn to our needs, our daily bread, our need for forgiveness and the ability to forgive others and deliverance from evil. But today we're going to think about this idea of daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. And when I think about daily bread, I think about an illustration I heard a handful of years ago about a thinking kite, a thinking kite. So imagine a kite on a string, and this kite has a mind of its own, and this kite resents the fact that is attached to this string and held by the boy on the ground. And the kite thinks to itself, if I could just cut this string and be free from this boy, then I could really soar. I could really fly in the sky. And so in this ridiculous illustration, this thinking kite says, I'm going to smuggle scissors up next time I go up into the sky. And so this kite smuggles scissors up, and the boy puts him up into the sky, and he's attached to the screen string, and then this thinking kite takes the scissors out and cuts the string. And now the kite is going to soar, right? Wrong. The kite doesn't know physics. 
The wind picks up, the kite goes and crashes to the ground because, see, the kite needs to be tethered to that string and to that boy to have that resistance against the wind to really soar. If the kite isn't tethered, if it's just free floating, the wind is going to crash it to the ground. I think about that with the Lord's Prayer. I think about this prayer of daily bread, that we need to be tethered to our Father. That as we pray and we're tethered to our Father, then we're invited to pray with the right perspective for daily bread. See, just as that kite couldn't soar unless it was tethered, we, brothers and sisters in Christ, Christians, to live the Christian life, we must be tethered to God. And in tethered to him, then we can pray and then we can soar. And so I want to think about five ideas. Now, don't worry, I'll move through them quickly. I normally do three, five But this idea of being tethered to our Father in heaven, we pray for perspective, for physical needs, for dependence, for others, and for deeper needs. See, all in this phrase, give us today our daily bread, is prayer for these things. So first this idea, so we are tethered. As we're tethered to our Father in heaven, we pray for perspective. I think the only way to pray this prayer for daily bread is we first have to keep in perspective what has come in this prayer before. Who have we prayed to? He's our Father in heaven. That is who God is. Jesus, I want you to know who God is. He's a Father, the best version of a Father. And who is this God? He is omnipotent, He's all powerful. And He's omniscient, He's all knowing. And He's omnipresent, He's all present. He has all power, all knowledge, all glory. He's our Father in heaven. That's why hymn writer John Newton in his hymn, Thou art coming to a king, penned these words. Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and his power are such. None can ever ask too much. None can ever ask too much. He's our Father in heaven, all powerful, all knowing, all present, and therefore we hallow his name. God, you are glorified, you are holy, you are great. And the invitation, the, the method in praying here is let's fix our eyes on God and his greatness and his goodness and his glory. And then, and yes, pray for our needs, but after fixing our eyes on his hallowedness and his glory, then do we fix our attention to our needs. And we pray, your will be done. God, you know what's best. You are great and you are glorious. And as we sung already, you are a good and gracious king. So we want your will, not our will. So we pray for perspective. God, you're our father and you're hallowed and you know what's best. And as we are tethered to our father, we pray that way. It makes me think of a, of a musical technique called circular breathing. See, circular breathing is where you you breathe in through your nose and you breathe out through your mouth into the instrument at the same time. It's this circular motion that you inhale the air and and then you play that instrument and blow out. And the trick to this technique is you need a reserve in your your cheeks, a reserve of air when you begin. Uh, Kenny G, if any Kenny G fans in the room... (laughs) He is the Guinness Book of World Records for playing the longest musical note. He played an E flat for 45 minutes. Isn't that astounding? He did it through circular breathing. Year after year after year, it almost took him two decades to master this technique. He would breathe in and play out at the same time. Isn't that what the Lord's Prayer is? We breathe in who God is. God, you are the best version of a father. You are a good and gracious king. We breathe that in. God, you are hallowed. You are glorified. You are great. You are good. You know what's best. Your will be done. We breathe that in, and we let that breathe out our petitions and our prayers and our needs. Tethered to the Father, we pray for perspective. We need the beginning of the Lord's Prayer before we get to daily bread. And then... Tethered to our Father, we pray for our physical needs. Verse 11, again, give us today our daily bread. Keep us alive with three square meals. What is this bread? What is Jesus talking about? It is bread on the one hand, and bread is the symbol for just our basic needs. 
our basic survival to sustain us. We need the calories. We need the bread. But bread is also a stand-in, a metaphor for what is necessary for living. So yes, it's this idea of bread and food, but it is bigger than that. There's more inside the wardrobe than on the outside. There's more to this word bread than simply a loaf of bread. The great church reformer Martin Luther, he said, wrapped up in this word bread is a prayer for food and health and shelter and meaningful relationships and peace and good government. In that word bread is a prayer for protection from calamities and sickness and hard times and war. So when we pray, God, give us today our daily bread, we're praying, sustain us, protect us, give us what we need, meat. Meet our physical needs. But there's more here. This is interesting. So you see, give us today our daily bread. Okay? So the word today in the original language is, is very clear and very easy. This day. To this day would you give us our daily bread. Our bread. But that word daily, this is the only time in Greek literature that this word daily is used. And commentators have, have written a lot about what does this word mean? Today is very clear this day, but daily could mean time, it could mean amount. So it could be, be give us like a daily, a repetition, like a doubling down time. This day we need, we need you to meet our needs. Some have thought maybe it means tomorrow. Almost like a prayer at the end of the day, Lord, would you, would you meet my daily needs tomorrow? I need bread today and I need bread tomorrow. Others have thought maybe it's not about time at all. Maybe it's about amount. Because we've already had time in the prayer. Give us today. So maybe it's an amount. Just give us enough to stay alive. That's what daily means. Give us enough to stay alive today. Protect us today. And then others have said maybe that's a little bit too harsh. Maybe what it really means is the bread that we need. I love what Bible commentator Ken Bailey, he put it this way. And I want this to let kind of shape you as you think about this prayer. He says it's a prayer to pray, give us today the bread that doesn't run out. I like that. Give us the bread today that doesn't run out. There's a sense of time there today and tomorrow. There's a sense of amount. There's this idea of not just a slice on the table, but a loaf in the cabinet. There's a sense here of Jesus turning water into vintage wine. Lord, Lord, give us the bread that doesn't run out. Meet our needs. Lord, provide for us. Provide for our physical needs. Now, I want you to see, though, there's a couple of things I want you to see in this prayer for praying for physical needs. It's not a prayer for cake, is it? It's a prayer for bread. Now, there's nothing wrong with dessert. We like dessert in our family. And it's good to, like, enjoy the nicer things of life. But what this prayer is praying against is consumerism. It's not, God, give me everything in my Amazon cart. God, don't give me everything. I, I, don't, I want everything in the aisles of Target. Lord, I want the American dream. See, it's a pushing against consumerism. It's a prayer for your physical needs. Shelter, relationships, peace, health. It's a prayer against consumerism. And also, there is something so basic and honest with this prayer. And we'll go on to later how wrapped up in this prayer is a prayer for deep spiritual needs. But on the surface, this is just a prayer, a basic prayer that we can come to God simply with basic needs, ordinary day-to-day things, that God cares about those things, that God cares about our next meal. He cares about shelter. He cares about providing for our needs. And there's an invitation here that we can come with basic, everyday, ordinary things. And God cares about those. But there's also a prayer here for contentment and to push against fear. So we, it is normal and natural to live in this world that we have fears. Will we have enough? Will there be enough? What about the future? And this is a prayer to pray against fear and to pray for contentment. In a way, it's like Proverbs 30, 8 and 9 says this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. 
but give me only my, ba- my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and dishonor the name of my God. See, tethered to the Father, we pray for perspective. We fix our eyes on him and then we come to our needs. But also tethered to the Father, we pray for our physical needs. But third, pray, tethered to the Father, we pray for dependence. This is a prayer of dependence. A first word in this phrase Give. Almost sounds presumptuous, demanding. God, give me. But it's like a child going to the best version of a father, acknowledging their dependence on that father and saying, Father, can you, will you give me? Will you give me what I need? You know, later in the Sermon on the Mount, there's this, this teaching moment where Jesus is teaching and he's saying, you know, which of you, if your son, if your child asks for bread, you give him a stone? Or which of you, if he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? And he's saying, if then, though you're evil, though you're, you're in a sense, nothing compared to God, you would give your child these good things, how much more will your Father in heaven give you things that are good? So we come with a sense of dependence like a child on their parent. God, you are a good giver. You're a good and gracious God. And this sense of coming to God and praying for dependence, we're We're admitting that bread is a gift, not a right. See, we live in a world where performance leads to prize. The default mode of the human heart is I will perform and I will achieve and now I have a right to that. And this prayer pushes against that. It's a prayer of dependence. And see, that... That idea, that default mode of the human heart where performance leads to prize, it can look like religion, but it also can look like a non-religious kind of sphere as well. You know, from a religious standpoint, it's this idea of we perform, we give God what he wants or we think he wants. So we're going we're gonna to live this life. We're going to give him these rituals. We're going to give him money and time and prayer. We're going to give him these things. And then how the, the halls of history would say, okay, we give you, God, that. Now give us the victory in the battle. <laughs> give us the harvest. Inflict pain on our enemy. Its performance equals a prize. Or in a, in a non-religious, in an irreligious setting, it's this idea of pragmatic efficiency. No pain, no gain. You only get what you put into it. Or as an aside, which this is not in the Bible, God helps those who help themselves. Not a Bible verse, just FYI. But it's performance leads to prize. I put the time in. I have a right to this. And the biblical vision is different than that. See, God doesn't wait for us to perform. God doesn't wait for us to initiate. He is the initiator. He is the one who acts. Blessing then leads to our response. Our response does not lead to blessing. So tethered to the Father, this is a prayer of dependence. God, I am a child dependent on you. I am dependent on you to be gracious and merciful towards me. Your blessing leads to my response. You know, there's a, a Latin phrase, lex arendi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. There'll be a test afterwards. So. <laughs> lex arendi means the law of praying. Lex credendi means the law of believing. Lex vivendi means the law of living. And the reason I'm saying that is because when we we get into the habit of praying this way and taking seriously our dependence on God, that act of regularly praying, God give me, leads to believing that God is gracious, which leads to living dependent on God. You see how that works? We pray, God give me. God, I'm dependent on you. And then we believe that God is gracious and he will do that. And we live our life with dependence on him. It's that circular breathing idea again. The law of praying, the law of believing, the law of living, tethered to the Father. We pray for perspective. We pray for our physical needs. We pray for dependence. Fourth, we pray for others. And we've talked about this a bit in this sermon series, but throughout the Lord's Prayer, there is no personal pronouns. 
There's no I, there's no me, there's no mine. You know, it's not less than your needs. You certainly pray for your needs, but it is more than our needs. The Lord's Prayer expands our horizons. Yes, it's our needs. Yes, it's our forgiveness. Yes, it's our deliverance. But it's also those we are in family with, in community with, who we worship with, who our neighbor is. Mother Teresa, she tells a wonderful story that gets at this idea. She writes up this story about when one night uh, a gentleman came to her home. And this man asked for food for a family. There was a family with eight children who hadn't eaten for a long time. And this man asked Mother Teresa, do you think you could help them? And so Mother Teresa, you know, puts some rice together and she takes this over to the family so that they can eat. And as she gives the rice to the mother of these eight children, the mother takes the rice and she divides it in two. And she takes half the rice and she leaves for a moment with the rice, and she comes back, and the rice isn't with her. And Mother Teresa says, well, where did you go? And this mother of the eight children said, they, they are hungry also. And the they that this mother was referring to was a family next door who hadn't eaten in a long time as well. And Mother Teresa tells the story of this mother who was overcome by hunger pains and for her children was aware of the family next to them that was in need, and so she took half the rice and she brought it to that family as well. It's not, it's not my rice. It's our rice. It's not my bread. It's our bread. And see, this simple phrase that seems bigger than it just looks, give us today our daily bread. See, it calls us to, yes, pray for our needs, our physical needs and our sense of dependence, but it also expands our horizons and invites us to look around and pray for the needs of our family members and friends, to pray for those who live to the right and left of us, to pray for those we are in church community with, to pray for the global church. Maybe there's a city, maybe there's a country in the world that you have visited or lived in or have a heart for. Maybe this is an invitation for you to regularly pray for the physical needs of that community. See, it's not, it's not my rice, it's it's our rice. It's not my bread. It's, it's our bread. See, when we are tethered to the Father, our, our imagination, our praying imagination widens. And we don't just pray for ourselves. We see around us. But then finally, we pray for deeper needs. And this is where that John passage comes in, John 6. Because just when we think we've got a, a handle on this idea of praying for dependence and praying for perspective and praying for physical needs and praying for the needs of others, then when we, we have the whole Bible in mind, Jesus expands our imagination and he says, what? I am. I am the bread of life. Seven times in Jesus' life, he would say, I am something. Echoing when God spoke to Moses and said, I am who I am. Jesus is saying, I am God. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. If you believe in me, if you cling to me, if you trust in me, if you metaphorically eat my bread, you will live with me. But there's a tension, and if you think about food, there's GMO food, and there's organic food. There's genetically modified food that is just a means to an end, and there's organic, rich, dense food. And in this idea, give us today our daily bread, I think sometimes we are tempted, and as Will helped us to show, we need to repent from settling for GMO bread. We don't pray for perspective. We tell God what we know is best. And we don't pray just for our physical needs, but we pray for our consumeristic wants more than we admit. And we don't pray for dependence. We pray through performance. God, look what I did. Look what I know. Look what I've done. Pay up. You owe me. We don't pray for others. We're so fixated on our bread that we can't lift our eyes and see the needs of those around us. And we don't pray for the deeper bread of Christ. We think we are in charge. But we need the rich, organic bread of Christ when he says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. Or again, as the great German reformer Martin Luther said, and I love this quote, he says, Jesus himself will be the donor and the baker, the waiter, the brewer, yes, the cook, and also the dish and the plate that gives imperishable food. We can't give ourselves this food. We must obtain it from the Son of Man. Jesus says, I have the bread that you really need. Yes, pray for your physical needs, and that is important, but you have a deeper need. And I can give that bread to you. I can meet that need. I can take that guilt and that shame and that hurt and those past mistakes upon myself, and I can set you free. You've been eating this GMO bread, this fake version of what it means to live a spiritual life. Lean in me and find real life. So we pray today for perspective. God, you're our Father. Hallowed be your name. You know what's best. We pray for our physical needs. God, sustain us through this life. We pray for dependence. We are children dependent on you. God, you bless and we respond. We aren't owed anything. You are a gracious and good king. We pray for others. We lift our eyes up and Yes, we pray for our needs, but we pray for the rice of other people. We don't settle for a cheap version of bread. We pray. We pray for the bread of Jesus, which we come to every week, don't we? I mean, this actual bread and this cup are our placeholders, our visual aids for us to remember that Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection is what we need. We come to it every week to remember that he is the bread of life. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the cup. It was the cup of the new covenant in his blood, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And whenever we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we aren't settling for a cheap, modified version of the life we really need. We're eating the true food, the real food of Christ, who takes our sin and our guilt and our shame and our pain and gives us grace and mercy and liberation in real life. So, Father, thank you for this bread. Thank you for the cup. Lord, thank you for the invitation to come to this table Lord, we come holding all the ways in which we we lean into consumerism and we, we focus only on our needs. And Lord, we feel like we don't view you as a father, but an employer who owes us. For all the ways in which we settle for a cheap version of the food we really need, which is your grace and mercy in our lives. Lord, we, we carry all that and we lay it at the table. And we say, yes, Jesus, give us the bread that we need. Give us your life, the life we couldn't live. Give us your death, the one we should have died. Give us your resurrection, that we have hope in the life to come. Give us today, this day, our daily bread. And we pray together with one voice the prayer you taught us to pray, praying aloud, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand and come forward. Eat and drink when you're ready. Come to the bread and life of Christ.
Let's stand together as we finish our service this morning. And as I was thinking about the message that Patrick gave this morning, uh, this last hymn, uh, we're singing this one as a real uh, declaration of dependence upon God. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes in my prayer life, I've prayed for some things that God never gives me. Um, and at those times, it can feel like um, whether is, is God listening? Is he with us? Does he care? Um, and I think what I've found is that um, in those prayers, it's far more about me than it is my dependence upon him and what God wants to give me. Uh, and that we can rest in knowing that God is present with us by his spirit, that we can rely on him uh, for he is there with us, and which is why we do need him every hour. Uh, so let's sing this old hymn together, I Need Thee Every Hour. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like mine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee, Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you today and give you peace. Amen.